Thank you so much for coming out to January's uh, first Wednesday on this cold night. We always seem to have cold nights in January, but I'm always filled with warmth when I look out and see everybody standing or sitting in this case, ready to hear some wonderful, uh, some wonderful new knowledge. Uh, my name is Lucinda Walker, and I am the director of the Norwich Public, uh, Norwich Public Library. Um, first Wednesdays is a program of the Vermont Humanities Council, and it is co-hosted here in Norwich by the Library and the Historical Society. And we would like to thank our sponsors, the Friends of the Norwich Public Library, the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Ledger National Bank, Mascoma Savings Bank, and the Norwich Historical Society. Um, I would like to ask you all to turn off your mobile devices before we get started. And I just want to let you know, January is not just a new year, but it is a brand new year of programming that is being brought to the town and to the Upper Valley by the Norwich Library and the Historical Society. So if you will just indulge me for a minute, let me just give you a heads up of what's coming down the pike. Next month, um, Emily Bernard from UVM will be talking about Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. And in anticipation of that, we are having a book discussion on Beloved. It will be held um, on Tuesday, January 26th at 7 p.m. at the library. We have copies of the book available for loan uh, with thanks to the Humanities Council. And Suzanne Brown will be facilitating the discussion. And it is open to any interested party. And if you just want to come, if you haven't read the novel, the, the conversation will be very interesting. So that's in advance of next month's First Wednesdays. Um, also through the Humanities Council, the library will be doing a celebration of Shackleton. This year's community read for Vermont is Endurance by Caroline Alexander. It is the 100th anniversary of the finishing of that wonderful expedition by Charles Shackleton. So the library is working with a number of different organizations in Dartmouth College and the Montshire Museum and the Historical Society to offer a large number of programs for all ages about Shackleton, Antarctica, climate change, science, intrepid explorers. So keep your eyes open for that. And the Historical Society has new programs. Um, they're going to be doing a memoir writing workshop in January, February, and March. And also, they are doing a memoir book discussion starting in February. And the books they'll be talking about are Robert Graves' Goodbye to All That, Beryl Markham's West with the Wind, or West with the Night, Oliver Sacks on the Move, and Anthony Shadid's House of Stone. And we've been passing out information on all of these programs. So thank you very much. Um, the other thing I just want to make sure is, did everyone receive Cymbeline, the crib sheet, if you will, put together by our speaker tonight. If you haven't, just let us know and we'll pass them out to you. And without further ado, let me introduce to you um, Peter Gilbert, the executive director of the Vermont Humanities Council, because he has some interesting news about what's happening with them. So thank you, Peter. Well, thank you for coming this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the statewide sponsors for Vermont uh, for First Wednesdays. That covers, uh, helps us support these First Wednesdays programs in all nine of the sites around the state. They are the uh, Vermont Department of Libraries and National Life Group Foundation. We're very grateful to them for their support. It is a real pleasure uh, to be here this evening to mark with you the 400th anniversary year of William Shakespeare's death and to introduce and hear our very special speaker this evening. Professor Pio, Peter Saccio's talk this evening is one of three First Wednesday's talks uh, being held this month and next that look at Shakespeare's life and legacy. Also tonight is one of them in Essex Junction, Middlebury uh, College, Professor Timothy Billings is talking about Shakespeare's 400-year career. Very few of us have a 400-year career, I'm afraid. And on February 3rd, Columbia University Professor James Shapiro will be speaking uh, on the history of Shakespeare in America in Middlebury. That talk will be presented uh, by the Vermont Humanities Council in partnership with uh, Middlebury College, which will have on display 
next month at its Museum of Art, um, all throughout February, a first folio. But it's, it's currently on a national tour, and we encourage you to uh, visit the museum and view that rare Shakespeare manuscript. Professor Peter Saccio is the Leon D. Black Professor of Shakespearean Studies and Professor of English Emeritus at Dartmouth College. At Dartmouth, he has uh, been honored with the J. Kenneth Huntington Memorial Award for Outstanding Teaching. He's also a scholar for the teaching companies, the CD and DVD course of Shakespeare, comedies, histories, and tragedies. He's received, he received his PhD from Princeton. He's the author of, among other texts, Shakespeare's English Kings, which is a classic. He is also an accomplished actor and director, a theater director. He's uh, directed productions of a number of Shakespeare plays, including Symboline, uh, which of course is uh, the topic for his talk this evening. I'm pleased and honored that he has spoken for First Wednesdays, um, uh, as part of First Wednesdays, for the Humanities Council in a, in a, at a fall conference, and at First Wednesdays in each of the nine sites around the state. And having covered all nine of those, he decided essentially re to retire from First Wednesdays, and I'm enormously grateful and pleased that he has agreed to come, as it were, out of retirement to um, address us this evening uh, in light of the 400th anniversary and the first folio coming to Vermont. Uh, next uh, month. I'm pleased and honored uh, to have him here. Please join me in welcoming a dear friend of mine and a great friend of the Vermont Humanities Council, Peter Sachs. One thing that Peter Gilbert didn't mention in introducing me that I think is relevant was that he was my student at Dartmouth. <laughs> <laughs> and a very good one, too. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have excellent students, particularly if they go on and invite you to do something more. Um, yes, it is the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death this year. I find it weird to celebrate somebody's death. Uh, I'd rather celebrate his birth, but that would be uh, 2064 and I won't be around. <laughs> um, this is going to be a celebratory year. I'm not quite sure what's being done in America. I know what's being done in Britain because I am in close contact with the education director at Shakespeare's Globe in London. And he tells me that if I come over, I will not be able to take a step right, left, or forward, or backward without running into something about the anniversary. Not just a revival of this or that play, but a new play based on the same plot, uh, or an opera, based on the same plot, or a play about Shakespeare himself. Uh, it's going to be wild over there. Uh, as um, uh, Peter was kind enough to uh, write me and say, will you come out of retirement? Will you help us inaugurate this Shakespeare anniversary year? And I thought about it, and I gave him a very weird title. Cymbeline, the first folio, uh, and the rest of Shakespeare. <laughs> now, it, it, you're not going to be here all night. I will not talk about all the rest of Shakespeare. I'll explain why the rest of Shakespeare comes in to a talk about this play as I go forward. Uh, the first folio is important. Peter was very pleased uh, to tell me uh, that there will be uh, a copy of the first folio uh, at uh, Middlebury uh, through the month of uh, February, and you can go and see it. You can also just go across the river and see it, see it at Dartmouth. Uh, and when I looked it up yesterday on the, on the uh, 
uh, Dartmouth Library uh, online, it said in library use, which I think means it's on display. Uh, 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 the important thing about the folio is that it is the biggest source we have for Shakespeare's texts. Um, 18 of his plays were published during his own lifetime in what we call quartos, cheap little paperbacks. We wouldn't have the other 18 if Shakespeare's fellow actors hadn't got together a few years after his death and assembled the whole uh, for, in a volume that they called uh, Master William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies. Um, uh, we call it the first folio because it is a collected edition in a larger format. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a second folio and a third folio, which got in some other plays uh, as well. Uh, but uh, it's uh, the biggest book in English, except perhaps the King James translation of the Bible, which came about almost the same time. Uh, all right, I'll stop and tell my favorite joke. Uh, uh, Shakespeare was enormous in his vocabulary. Um, uh, not only uh, the words in use that he put to further use, but in words he invented. And uh, the total, uh, total number of the words he used at least once, sometimes many times, like love or death or whatever, uh, is about uh, 2,700, which is an enormous vocabulary. You and I use, you know, uh, um, 2,000, 3,000 to get around in daily life. The King James Bible uses about 7,000. Shakespeare knew more words than God, <laughs> <laughs> or at least was willing to invent them. Uh, God was presumably busy inventing things. Uh, that was a digression. I've got to find myself back on the, the first folio. And the rest of Shakespeare will come along later, but the first title, the first word in the title, is symboly. And this, I admit, is eccentric of me. This is an obscure play, not very often performed, although, as Peter said, I had produced it at Dartmouth uh, uh, with undergraduate actors and had a wonderful time doing it. Uh, I chose this for a number of reasons. First, because I love it. I, I, I just enjoy it very much. Um, also because if you don't know it, you should have your horizons expanded. Uh, those of you who are interested enough to, have, to come to a lecture on Shakespeare, this is not going to be about one of the half dozen that anybody who reads or sees Shakespeare uh, 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 will know from school or college. Uh, the man was a various and fertile and experimental artist. And in this case, he was writing very near the end of his career, an old-fashioned romance full of unlikely episodes. It's like going to see Star Wars. And I haven't seen the new one yet, I, I, so I won't carry out that comparison. Uh, uh, take in hand the handout, please. And if you don't have a handout, you need one, because it, it's hard to follow all these names. Uh, does anybody still need one? On the front page, page one, uh, you will see the characters listed uh, in a more or less logical way. <coughs> Cymbeline was a king of Britain. Uh, he is an historical character. Uh, uh, the Romans called him Cunobelinus, but that's Latin, uh, and it got transformed in the Middle Ages and into Shakespeare's time into Cymbeline. He is historical, uh, but he doesn't seem to be a very effective king. 
uh, indeed, he is deceived uh, and makes bad judgments uh, continuously until the last scene. The queen, who has, is given no name, is his second wife, and she's a queen straight out of Snow White, uh, <laughs> jealous of her daughter's beauty and the fact that her daughter seems to be about to inherit the throne of Britain. Uh, her daughter does have two brothers, or did have two brothers, Guiderius and Arviragus. Uh, but they were lost, uh, stolen from their cradles in infancy, and nobody has seen them for 20 years. Uh, we are told this in the first scene, so we know perfectly well that they're going to turn up eventually. <laughs> Imogen is the daughter, and she is beautiful and much loved uh, and uh, kind and strong. Uh, Unfortunately, there's another quasi-member of the royal family on hand, her stepbrother, Cotton. And that's the way it pro is pronounced. Uh, it rhymes with rotten. <laughs> and so he is. Um, he is son of the queen by her previous marriage. And the queen wants him to inherit the throne, of course. But Imogen has married Pistumus Leonatus. Uh, he is a gentleman, uh, which means he's not a peasant, but he's not royalty either. Uh, he was the son of a previous British hero, um, whose, uh, his father died, uh, his brothers died in battle, um, his mother died in childbirth, giving birth to him. Uh, so he was raised by King Cymbeline. Uh, uh, Cymbeline adopted him, but Cymbeline is very annoyed that his daughter has secretly married him. This is a marriage out of her status, particularly since he is run around by the queen, uh, who wants Clotin to inherit the throne. They have a servant called Pisania, who is one of the wonderfully loyal characters who helps everybody uh, at convenient moments. Then we go back into uh, the past. There was Belerius, uh, a British general, uh, who was wrongly called a traitor and banished by the king. And it was he who stole Guiderius and Arviragus from their cradles. And they have lived in Wales, where they, uh, he brought them up. And then, uh, well, I can't stop there. Uh, uh, Pistumus is banished by the king for having secretly married Imogen, uh, and so he goes to Rome. All this is happening, by the way, while Augustus Caesar is ruling Rome. Uh, that is, the year is approximately 1 AD. Uh, we are dealing with ancient Britons and ancient Romans. Uh, also at uh, Philario's house is a Roman noble nobleman called Iacom, and he's a schemer. He is a Machiavelli. And here you will perceive that we are much mixed up in what period of time we might be. If it's 1 AD and Cymbeline and Augustus are ruling in Britain and Rome, uh, Filario and Iacomo have Italian names, Renaissance names, and Iacomo is straight out of Machiavelli. Uh, there's a Roman general, there's a Roman soothsayer, uh, uh, there's a British doctor, and way down at the bottom you will find Jupiter, the king of the gods, who actually appears, and in my own production at Dartmouth I played that role. <laughs> um, uh, what else do I have to say about these people before? Uh, I go any further. Oh, uh, Clotin, uh, uh, this stepson, uh, is a booby, a grotesque, uh, an odu ogre, a lecher. Uh, he wants to become the heir to the throne. He also wants Imogen. He finds her very attractive, too. Um, uh, and when uh, she flees the court, 
he goes after her, thinking it would be a wonderful idea to kill these tumors and to rape Imogen, uh, and then to boot her back to the court and claim the crown. In other words, he's something like a dragon out to devour a maiden, uh, and he gets killed by Guderius, and it's rather like a dragon being killed by St. George. Uh, Posthumus is our hero, uh, and I, I know it's odd to pronounce the name that way. Uh, we would say the name uh, in modern English as posthumous, uh, but Shakespeare clearly pronounces it posthumous. If you can read Iambic Pentameter, you know that. And Iacomo, uh, 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 I have said, is technically a Roman, but actually Italian. The story about uh, what he does comes from Boccaccio, uh, and he is uh, a considerable villain. Uh, in fact, in the original, or at least one of the, the original versions, versions uh, he is such a villain uh, that when his villainy is discovered, the sult Sultan of Egypt, where this version has the final scene, uh, thinks he deserves nothing but a hideous death. Um, he should be stripped, tied to a, uh, uh, a fence pole. Uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? It begins with S. Never mind. Hmm? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, smeared with honey and left to de devour in from insect bites uh, uh, from those insects that are attracted uh, to him. Uh, in many ways, this is a silly play. A useful reminder that we not, need not always take Shakespeare with monumental seriousness. Um, uh, some uh, who have tried uh, to take it with seriousness have gotten into trouble with Cymbeline and ended up contending it as a bad play. The most famous criticism of it comes from that 18th century monument of good common sense. Dr. Samuel Johnson, who did a whole edition of the complete Shakespeare and wrote a comment on each play and said of Cymbeline, this play has many just sentiments, some natural dialogues and some pleasing scenes, but they are obtained at the expense of much incongruity. That's the setup. Now comes the punchline. To remark the folly of the fiction, the absurdity of the conduct, the confusion of names and manners of different times, and the impossibility of the events in any system of life were to waste criticism upon unresisting imbecility, <laughs> upon two fault on, upon faults too evident for de detection and too gross for exaggeration. I will, I will not detail all the things that Johnson is referring to, except to say that they are just. In act full, Cymbeline, sorry, not Cymbeline, Imogen, is um, poisoned not actually poisoned. Uh, the drug merely causes a, a sleep that looks like death. Um, she does wake up. She finds herself beside a corpse, dressed in the clothes of her husband, as tumors. And uh, she weeps over it, naturally enough. Uh, but it isn't posthumous. it's cotton who, for a complicated series of reasons, is wearing the clothes of Posthumus, and his head has been cut off. Uh, this, Johnson found, was absurd. And when I produced it, I found that audiences found it absurd indeed. The actress playing Imogen 
rose up. And, and she has a speech saying, I know the shape of his body, his martial thigh, his, his feet mercurial. But she's his wife. Of course she knows his thighs. And the audience started laughing. But the character is in deep grief. And the actress was strong enough to overwhelm that laughter and impress the audience with their grief. It, 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 it's a remarkable moment. Um, uh, well, I, 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 I've given you the characters. Uh, let us pass on to uh, a more analytic approach uh, to the play. Turn your hand up. Oh. I've listed the characters again, but I've grouped them differently. Cymbeline, Queen, Clotten, Caius Lucius, the Roman general. Uh, the issue here is the tribute Britain supposedly owes to the Roman Empire, which Britain has refused to pay. Uh, largely because the queen is against it. I mean, the queen is responsible for everything, we, nearly everything we do. Um, the issue is also succession to the crown, because the queen wants Clotten uh, to inherit. Caius Lucius has come uh, as the uh, uh, ambassador uh, from Rome to demand the tribute. What we have here is a political, historical, plot that is like the, the English history plays that Shakespeare wrote, all those Richards and Henrys, and like the Roman plays that Shakespeare wrote, uh, uh, Julius Caesar and the Cleopatra, and so forth. That's one strand of the play. A bigger strand, in the sense that it takes more space, is the one concerning Imogen, Posthumus, Giacomo, Pisanio, and on the very edge, Clotten. Imogen uh, has married Posthumus. Posthumus has been banished, has gone to Rome. There, he is persuaded by the scheming Italian Giacomo. Uh, Giacomo thinks he can seduce any woman. Uh, and they make a wager. Uh, uh, Posthumus is an admirable young man, but rather naive, and he lets himself get trapped into this wager. Uh, uh, Giacomo says, I will come back from England uh, and prove to you that I have shared the dearest bodily part of your mistress. Uh, uh, Posthumus is convinced uh, I'll come back to how later. Uh, and he orders Pisanio back in Britain to kill Imogen. Uh, Clotten is involved in this because he wants Imogen too. In other words, what we've got here is a tragic comic plot that's like other things in Shakespeare, where a husband or male fiancé is persuaded wrongly uh, that his wife, or female fiancé, uh, is guilty of infidelity, uh, uh, adultery, unchastity. And that takes up a great deal of the play. Uh, that's utterly different from uh, uh, the historical story. As I say, it comes out of Renaissance uh, sources. Uh, um, uh, Boccaccio and other places. Then, Valerius, Guderius, Arviragus, Imogen in disguise as a page boy under the name of Fideli, and also Clotten. I didn't realize until I made out this list that Clotten is somehow involved in all of this, uh, which is odd, and I've got to write an article about that sometime. Uh, uh, but here we are in Wales. Uh, in a pastoral setting, uh, something like a harsher virgin, version of the Forest of Arden in As You Like. Uh, 
Valerius has brought up the boys who do not know that they are the sons of Symphony uh, as rustics, as mountaineers, as hunters. Uh, and the issues here are loyalty to the king. Valerius had been banished and resents that and doesn't want to tell the boys that they are really princes. And yet he recognizes that although these boys are lively hunters and mountaineers, that somehow they have the royal blood in them. They are princely by nature. Um, uh, they exert tremendous generosity uh, when they encounter uh, Imogen wandering in Wales looking for Pistumus. And eventually, they rescue the nation. Uh, uh, near in the big battle between Rome and Britain at the end of the play, uh, the whole Roman army is stopped in a narrow lane by an old man, two boys, and Pistumus backing them up. Uh, a whole Roman army uh, stopped by four people. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, now, uh, that's the pastoral heroic I've mentioned, the tragic, comic, and the historical. These are typical Shakespearean genres. But in this play, they're all put together in the same play. Uh, the episodes, the individual events, all seem to come out of other Shakespeare plays. They resemble a lot of the rest of Shakespeare. Cymbeline is like King Lear, misjudging his daughters and banishing Valerius, as Lear had banished Kent. The queen is like Goneril, or um, Lady Macbeth, plotting for the crown. Imogen, uh, leaving the court to look for her husband, disguises herself as a boy with Pisanio's A. In other words, she's like Rosalind, or Viola, uh, a young woman wandering in the wilderness, cannot wander as a young woman. Uh, she has to uh, look uh, more presentable than that, otherwise she might be raped. Um, uh, uh, she's like Rosalind, she's like Viola, she's also like Cordelia, uh, in that Cordelia resists uh, the bad judgment of her father. Uh, and usually in productions of, Cord of, of King Lear, she comes back leading, well, she does in the play come back leading the army of France to rescue her father, but she comes back dressed as a general. She generally looks like Joan of Arc uh, on the stage. Even more important in the tragic comic plot about the false accusation of uh, adultery, of infidelity. This is a fellow where it turns out to be a tragedy uh, and the deceived husband does kill his wife. Or much ado about nothing, um, where the same thing happens, their fiancés uh, and hero appears to die, uh, but happily uh, there is a happy end. A wicked schemer deceives an inexperienced husband into marital jealousy, and the wife dies, or nearly dies, as a result is one of Shakespeare's. There are several other examples in Mary Wife Windsor uh, and in The Winter's Tale. When I was teaching uh, this, uh, uh, the big Shakespeare course at Dartmouth, and uh, Peter has just informed me it was after that I had uh, he had taken the course. I used to use this as the last play in the course. It was a review text. <laughs> Do you remember all these stories <laughs> before you take the final exam? And I will tell you, if you want to know what sort of stories Shakespeare was fond of telling, you can read Cymbeline and skip all the rest of the first poem. <laughs> By the way,
this really does make a very good plot. Uh, if you turn back to my um, <coughs> handout on the second page, uh, section number three, you can pick it up. <laughs> uh, uh, item three is disguises. Uh, a lot of people get disguised in this play. Um, Imogen uh, dresses herself up as a boy, uh, wandering through the wilderness. Posthumus, when he comes back from Rome, comes as a Roman <laughs> soldier. And then he uh, dresses himself up as a poor peasant Briton soldier. Uh, and then back as a Roman in order to get arrested by the Britons. Uh, he goes through several disguises in Act 5 alone. Clotten, when he chases after Imogen uh, in order to rape her, uh, wears Posthumus's clothes. Now, this is not necessary. He does not need to hide his identity. But he's been deeply insulted by Imogen who told him, when he was courting her, that Posthumus' meanest garment <coughs> was worth more than any hair on his head. Uh, were they all made such men? And uh, Cotton is infuriated by this. Uh, he stamps on the ground and said, his meanest garment, his garment, his garment, his meanest garment, so he puts on Posthumus' clothes <coughs> in order to repay the insult uh, while he's inflicting the injury. Excuse me a moment. Yakima, when he comes to Britain in order to seduce uh, Imogen, is unsuccessful, of course, in seducing her. She is a chaste and wise young woman. But he manages to get into her bedchamber uh, and there note all the furnishings of the bedchamber and to note that she has a mole on her breast uh, and various other details uh, with which he convinces Posthumus that he has indeed Taste the dear, tasted the dearest bodily part of her. I don't know whether uh, he gets in because he has asked Imogen to protect a trunk of jewelry that they've gotten for Augustus Caesar. It's him who is in the trunk, not any jewelry. I suppose you could consider the trunk uh, a jewel uh, or, or, or a disguise. Uh, I had a great deal of trouble with the, the young actor who was playing Giacomo. He was very good at Giacomo, but getting out of the trunk uh, was, a, was a tricky bit of staging. He had to be carried on by other actors in this trunk, and it was a very noisy operation. Uh, and I had to say things like, look, well, this is making a noise. Would, wouldn't you reach out and make it silent as you could? Uh, uh, and then, Valerius, Guiderius, and Arviragus are disguised as Welsh mountaineers. And as I've mentioned, I think Guiderius and Arviragus don't even know that they're in disguise, don't even know that they really should be princes. Um, uh, that makes a wonderful set of things that have to be unraveled at the end of the play. All those disguises all those deceptions. The plot is an elaborate contraption. One of my friends who is here tonight uh, mentioned to me this morning that when she was reading a summary of it, it sounded like Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> and I think it's a very good idea. Uh, I won't try to work that out. I, I haven't had time to, to make the particular comparison. Uh, it is a contraption, a kind of Rube Goldberg machine. But it is a magnificent contraption. Every mistake, every deception, 
links up to all the others. It's all water tech, all water tech, and it all leads up to a dazzling final scene in which there are 24 perfectly coordinated revelations. Oh, that was me. No, I am not dead. Uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, all the characters are on stage, except the Queen and Plotten, who are in fact dead. Um, and each makes his or her own contribution to understanding what has happened in the previous four and a half acts. When that final scene begins, Imogen thinks her husband Posthumus is dead. Posthumus thinks that his wife is dead and had been unchaste beforehand. Uh, Guderius and Arvaragus think that Fideli is dead, and they don't know who Fideli was in the first place. She was their sister. Uh, Iacomo doesn't know who defeated him in the battle. It was Posthumus. Uh, no one knows what has become of Clotin. No one understands two prophecies that have suddenly arisen in the final act. And Cymbeline doesn't know anything at all. <laughs> but in the 470 lines of that final scene, Cymbeline becomes radiant Cymbeline who shines here in the West. The king and father of a restored daughter Two restored sons, a restored son-in-law, a restored general, and everybody is greeting each other as father, brother, sister, husband, wife. Cymbeline even calls himself the mother to the birth of Frey to, to, to get all the, the, the uh, uh, possible family relations in. One magnificent, loving family celebrated in a blaze of luminous poetic symbols, the lion, the eagle, the cedar, and the sun. And Britain itself is restored to the Roman Empire. Uh, technically, this is a superb piece of plot making. Uh, when one teaches Shakespeare, one is always confronted with students who say, in this or that play, in Macbeth, in, in Lear, in Othello, this doesn't make sense, this isn't coherent, the time scheme is wrong in Othello, and, and, and how many children had Lady Macbeth? And you have to say kind of helplessly, oh, forget about that, this isn't meant to be a detective story, uh, just pay attention to the human feelings. But this play, you can treat it as a, a detective story. Uh, it's the only time Shakespeare made it all work right, technically, in the plot structure. Theatrically, it is an enormous test of the ability of the actors and the director, that final scene. You've got all those characters on stage and you've got to move them around in the right way. More importantly, you have to get the focus right, because there are going to be 24 revelations and the audience has to be looking at the right character at the right time. But Stilmus is brought on as a Roman prisoner and has nothing to say until Imogen, who is disguised as a boy still, says to the king, ask Giacomo where he got that diamond ring. <coughs> and Stilmus says aside, what's that to him? But the point is that the diamond ring is crucial to the whole deception about Imogen being unchaste. And so we have to watch Posthumus as he listens to uh, uh, Giacomo's long explanation about how he deceived everybody uh, in the matter of uh, her fidelity. Technically, theatrically, and emotionally, the final scene involves an extraordinary range of uh, responses. Posthumus in that last scene still doesn't know that Imogen is still alive. He thinks his orders to have her killed have been carried out, and he is obsessed with grief and guilt. 
uh, and we cannot help feeling sympathetic to that. There are also some surefire laugh lines in that final scene. Uh, the final scene begins with the doctor explaining how the queen died madly, confessing all her evil plots. Uh, and then 200 lines later, when Imogen is saying, I thought I was poisoned, the doctor perks up again and says, oh, I forgot one thing the queen confessed. Uh, uh, in the production I did at Dartmouth, uh, uh, the doctor did that well. Cymbeline did it even better um, in, uh, at one one late revelation when he was utterly bewildered and he said, does the world go round? And he got not only a laugh, he got applause. <laughs> I was very pleased with that student. Uh, uh, okay, I, I think the play has a great deal of skillful uh, excellence. Uh, and it goes between comedy and, and, and tragedy uh, 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 with remarkable abruptness. Uh, I think that's one of the things that disturbed Dr. Johnson, that he wasn't used to that. Uh, the 18th century doesn't have that, that uh, uh, kind of mixture of audience uh, response. Um, so let me talk about the more serious things. Let me talk about the students, who is really the hero of the piece, uh, the young man. Uh, 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 who is praised at the beginning of the play as being a remarkable young man, worthy of adoption by the king, admired by all the court, and worthy of Imogen's love. But he is naive. He is misguided. Uh, he commits a foolish crime. He says to his friends in Rome that he is a young traveler, and he certainly is, uh, uh, proves himself to be that. He is easily deceived by this scheming uh, uh, Italian villain. Uh, Giacomo steals uh, the um, bracelet that Imogen had been given by Posthumus. Uh, he has the evidence of all the way her bedchamber looks. Um, uh, although Filario, his host, says this is not evidence enough, uh, 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 he nonetheless foolishly believes it, and he has a very angry soliloquy. Is there no way for men to be, but women must be half workers? I mean, can we not have children without women, wicked women, uh, cooperating in the act? We are all bastards, and that most venerable man which I did call my father was, I know not where, when I was stabbed. Some coiner with his tools made me a counterfeit. And yet my mother seemed the Diane of the time. And it goes on with a very angry speech about the wickedness of women. All women are unchaste. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 they all commit uh, infidelities. Um, and he ends up saying, uh, 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 listing the vices of of all women, uh, flattering, deceiving, lust and rank thoughts, revenges, ambition, cover coveting, changes of pride, disdain, nice longing, slanders, mutability, all faults that have a name, nay, that hell knows why hers in part or all, but rather all, for even to vice, they are not constant, but are changing still. One vice but of a minute old, for one not half so old at that. I'll write against them, detest them, curse them. 
Well, this is very angry and very foolish. What's he going to do? Run upstairs and write a satire against women uh, uh, because he uh, stupidly believes his wife has been unchaste. Uh, that is the basis upon which he is not only angry and silly, but murderous. Uh, sends the instructions to Pisania uh, to kill Imogen. <laughs> Then he disappears from the stage for two hours. <coughs> All the pastoral scenes uh, where Imogen, uh, in disguise, meets her brothers in weddings. When we next see him, he is repentant. He has been sent uh, a bloody cloth by Pisanio as evidence that, that Imogen is dead. In. Pure fairy tale. Um, yea, bloody cloth, I'll keep thee, for I wished thou shouldst be coloured thus. You married ones, if each of you should take this course, how many must murder wives must be much better than themselves for rioting but a little? And he goes on at great length about his grief and repentance. <coughs> Imogen has writhed but a little, in his opinion. Not because he suddenly has some 21st century idea that adultery doesn't matter very much. Uh, he thinks she has been unchaste and it does matter. But because he has done something worse. He has murdered her. And murder is a worse sin than adultery. He repents before he knows, uh, he repents his murder before he knows that it was entirely unnecessary, uh, that, that Imogen had been faithful to him all the time. Uh, because he repents, he can be forbidden, uh, forgiven. He repents, he wishes to die, and he does something even more. When the Romans and the Britons meet in battle, he has a single uh, uh, pair fight with Iacomo. He knows who Iacomo is. Iacomo doesn't know who he is. They fight, the stillness wins, but he leaves. He spares him. It's Shakespeare's longest and most explicit stage direction about how a fight should be conducted. Um, he forgives Jacob, and that is necessary for there to be a happy ending. It is necessary for Giacomo to survive, to explain how he deceived Posthumus in the first place, uh, how he didn't commit adultery uh, with uh, Imogen. He forgives Iacomo, he repents his own supposed murder of his wife, and Imogen uh, then forgives him. Uh, it is a story of a foolish crime followed by repentance and forgiveness. There's something more to it. I mentioned that in, in Act 4, uh, Imogen wakes up from her drugged sleep beside the corpse of, of, of Posthumus, uh, dressed, uh, no, she thinks it's the corpse of Posthumus. It's actually Clotten with the head cut off, but wearing Posthumus clothes. That is a kind of macabre joke at the expense of a Posthumus who has lost his head. <laughs> I owe that point to uh, Professor Robert Hunter, uh, with whom I taught Shakespeare for several years. He is now very elderly and living in Clotten. In, not in Clotten, in, in Kendall. <laughs> oh, my God. It's a late night in January. It is a good play. It is funny. It is 
strange. Uh, it is full of many things. Um, I'm going to come back uh, to uh, the final scene now. Um, uh, that uh, last scene where they all meet and they all come together. All the revelations are made. Everybody finds out that they're not dead or who killed whom or uh, what uh, uh, happens there. Um, there is one thing else that happens in this final scene or doesn't happen and may be perhaps inferred. Cymbeline is an odd character in history in a number of respects, but the one I want to point out is that we really don't know anything about it. And Hollinshed, uh, who is the source of Shakespeare's information for all his historical uh, plays, uh, uh, all those old kings, uh, not only the medieval Richards and Henrys, but Macbeth and Lear and, and, and Simbley. Hollinshed didn't know very much about it. He's not certain about the information. Uh, the whole business about the war between Britain and Rome over the tribute, uh, Hollinshed puts in the reign of Guiderix, who's, who's uh, uh, the son of Simbley. He's not even sure whether Guiderius was, was his son. He may, may have been his younger brother. Uh, uh, it's a, a, a messy bit of history, and we don't really know why Shakespeare chose him, chose Cymbeline, as the title character, the focal character uh, uh, of uh, a play. Except for one thing. Cymbeline ruled in Britain, and Augustus ruled in Rome, at the time that Jesus Christ was born. This is mentioned in Hollinshed's opening lines. This is the thing people, if they knew anything about Cymbeline, and I'm not saying everything in the global audience, everybody in the global audience did, uh, uh, but some of them would. This is the thing one knew about Cymbeline, uh, as one knew that uh, Richard III murdered his nephews in the tower, or Henry V conquered France in Agincourt, uh, that Cymbeline was ruling in Britain at the time of Christ's birth. Uh, if you don't happen to know it, the matter won't register on your uh, consciousness, although there are hints in the language, just hints. Cymbeline has a line saying, my peace, we will begin. That's after all the solutions have been arrived at, and he's wrapping everything up in a final speech. Imogen has a line about this gracious season which ought to be familiar language uh, to Christians among you. This is somehow a unique moment in human history. No messenger comes rushing in to say, there was just a very odd birth in Judea. <laughs> Although given the 24 revelations, I wouldn't be surprised if the 25th if, if <laughs> But what happens in that final scene is that everybody is forgiven. Pardon is the word to all, says Symboline. Mercy, that is the word to all. Our peace we will begin. If that context was available to any member of the audience, this is Shakespeare's Christmas play. <laughs> yes? Was this one of Shakespeare's late plays? Yes, it was. Uh, the date is 
some, somewhere around 1608 and 1609, uh, and it belongs with The Tempest and the Winter, Winter's Tale, which also have long journeys and, and, and uh, fantastical happenings. Do you think that's why it's so, everything is so neatly tied together about loose ends and why it's so complex? Uh, I can't really speculate about that. Uh, I, 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 I do think he was out to do some wild experiment and having, having fun with it. Uh, and The Winter's Tale has an 18-year gap between Act 3 and Act 4. Um, uh, the, uh, the Tempest is much more compact. Uh, uh, but yes, I think, he would, I think he was playing around. Uh, and one reason for it may be uh, that at this point in the career, not just of Shakespeare, but the whole King's Men, his company, uh, had begun to occupy the indoor theater uh, called the Blackfriars um, and, and to produce plays there uh, as well as the outdoor, uh, and, and to be able to do it in the winter. Um, uh, as well as the outdoor theater in the Globe, which was playable only in, in the summer. And that a different kind of play uh, seemed in order for that space. Mm -hmm. I know that the institution called Shakespeare's Globe, now in London, uh, now has an indoor theater as well as an outdoor theater. And they're doing those last plays this winter. I hope to get over and see what they do with Simply. There's another hand here. Yeah, yes, sir. Me? Uh, uh, I thought there was a gentleman with a pen in his hand. That would be me and I would... Oh, and then you're not a gentleman. I beg your pardon. <laughs> what do you know about its production at the time and how it was received? I know almost nothing. Uh, I know uh, uh, the rough date uh, and that it was, uh, it was suitable for experimentation uh, in that indoor theater, the Blackfriars. I also know that it was played at the Globe because the one account of it we have is from a doctor who liked to write down plot summaries uh, in, his, in his diary. And he wrote down a plot summary of Symboli. Um, the plot is so complicated that even he got it wrong. <laughs> uh, he got the order of events mixed up. But if you just saw the play once, anybody would get the order of events mixed up. Uh, there is no uh, other response uh, to it in writing of the time. It was not liked in the 18th century, uh, uh, as Dr. Johnson indicates. It came to be liked a lot in the 19th century, given spectacular production um, in the big uh, theaters of Covent Garden and Drury Lane, uh, because they went in heavily for ancient Roman stuff and ancient uh, British stuff. Uh, and actresses, in particular, were famous for their performances of, of Imogen. Uh, I have seen it uh, done in that kind of way, in a big, spectacular, fairy tale kind of way, at the Royal Shakespeare Company in, in Stratford. I've also seen it done emphasizing all the comedy. Uh, there was a production a couple of years ago by a company in Off-Broadway uh, that calls itself the Fiasco Company, <laughs> with eight actors doubling all the roles and played all the jokes up as, as much as, 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 as they could. Uh, I enjoyed that, too. Uh, it didn't quite work for the final scene because you've got too many characters on stage for, for eight actors to play. Uh, but that was the only defect. Yes? I just have a question. <clears throat> Notwithstanding the fact that he was devoted to life to teaching Shakespeare, um, would you be open to the idea that Shakespeare, or really a secondary actor, with an indifferent education, 
<coughs> with no access or very little to the life of the poor, um, did not write these plays, but rather someone by the name of Edward de Vere, who was a nobleman. Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. Can you repeat the question? Uh, the, 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 thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, the question is, would I be open to the idea, and that was very brilliantly phrased, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, these were not Shakespeare's plays, but were written by somebody else, uh, given that Shakespeare's education was modest and his court contact uh, and, also. And I mean, you yourself said that um, the vocabulary of plays, where you said 2,700, but you meant 27,000 words yeah. are used. Um, and um, the educated person today uses about 2,500 words. Yeah. This man, Shakespeare, was not educated in any way to that level. Well, uh, let me answer in a couple of steps. Uh, first step, he did go to a, a very good grammar school, uh, King Edward's school in Stratford-on-Avon, and the education was heavily literary. Uh, it was not split up as, as we do with social science and science and so forth. Uh, he learned Latin uh, 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 for a boy with um, uh, linguistic ability. It was a superb education. Uh, uh, secondly, um, what counts as evidence? Direct evidence uh, would be uh, the name of a writer on a published play, which exists for half of the quartos and of course for the first folio as well. Um, Everything else, is, and of course, other people writing at the time, commenting on Shakespeare's plays, uh, which we have uh, uh, with his name given as author. Uh, uh, anything else is speculative. Uh, uh, third point, uh, there were about 200 people uh, involved in the theater at any given time in Shakespeare's uh, 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 time. Uh, everybody would have known who was doing what. Uh, if you, uh, there are a great many more people than that, thousands of people involved in the New York theater, and they all know who's doing what. If some new director has been brought in uh, to rescue a play uh, 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 or uh, 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 who's designing what, or who's what the plan, who's sleeping with whom. Um, uh, it is to me incredible to imagine that uh, somebody else wrote those plays with no mention of it in any surviving document from that period. The speculation that somebody else wrote the plays uh, was um, uh, didn't arise until the late 19th century, uh, and, and, and there's no documentary evidence uh, for that earlier. And finally, on the matter, on the matter of, of um, uh, knowledge of the court uh, and the Earl of Oxford, uh, there's no evidence that noblemen can write any better than commoners. Uh, I've met a number of noblemen, some of them have been very stupid indeed. Uh, it is, I think, snobbery uh, to assume that good plays can only be written by men of very high birth. I'm not implying that at all. I'm only implying that it's necessary to be familiar with the plays and the plays that you write uh, well, it's more like um, uh, practically everybody writing plays in Shakespeare's time, and a lot of people were, were writing about kings and queens. Uh, that was the subject matter for plays. Did Agatha Christie ever commit a murder? 
<laughs> yes. I'm struck by how playful this play is, especially as you play with it. Uh, wondering whether, just as there are these different genres that you come up and so forth, all in a sense being funneled into a single vehicle, uh, you might be playing with the notion of play, playing with, as musical instruments, playing as in games, and so on. I think he is. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the question was, since playing with the different genres uh, that Shakespeare used uh, in this particular play, is he in fact playing with the whole idea of writing a play? Um, uh, and yes, uh, that, uh, my colleagues across the river call that metatheatricalism. Uh, and yes, there's, there's something like that going on here. Uh, he's, he's enjoying himself uh, and having fun uh, with the things that he can do. Um, uh, one of the things, for example, uh, that's odd about this play is the number of soliloquies. Uh, Shakespeare had been developing the soliloquy uh, with Hamlet, with Macbeth, uh, where they are truly profound, uh, 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 with what we call the, the major tragedies. And they are deeply felt personal things. Uh, I, I'm not even sure that Macbeth knows what he's saying until he hears himself say it. Uh, in this play, there are 27 soliloquies, and some of them are those deeply uh, uh, spiritual, introspective things. But most of them are just information to the audience about the plot, because the plot is, uh, and that, I think, is a game for Shakespeare. Uh, my, my favorite one is the one of the doctor after he's given the box of poison to the queen, and he has 12 lines saying, that's not really poison I gave the queen. Uh, and, and it's that kind of playfulness, as well as this sincere moments of this children's grief and, and repentance that attracts me to the play, that you can do both of those things in the same play. Yes, ma'am? As a matter of curiosity, has anyone ever made a, an estimate or a count of the number of words we owe to the invention of Shakespeare? Yes, and I've forgotten what it is. Um, uh, uh, the, the question was, has anybody uh, um, uh, uh, made an estimate or count of the number of words Shakespeare invented in his whole uh, uh, body of work? Uh, and I, I, I simply don't remember what the figure is. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, ones he uses just once and passes on. Uh, there are ones he uses in an odd way when Macbeth is thinking about killing the king. He uses the word assassination. That's perfectly familiar to us. It's the first time the word appears in print in English. Uh, and it seems to be a euphemism. He doesn't want to say murder. Um, uh, and it's always difficult about the counting because the figure that we have whatever it is, uh, and I'm sorry I don't remember it, is based on the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, and the people who put that together uh, uh, used Shakespeare all the time. They weren't reading everything that was in print in Shakespeare's time, so the word might have appeared earlier and they, and they didn't know it. But yes, he was, he, he was fertile of words. That isn't to be taken, by the way, uh, as a mere guarantee of his excellence. Uh, Samuel Beckett uses very few words, and he's a very good playwright, too. Yes? Uh, I noticed that a lot of the new productions are very much updated with music, but that was the reason I'm going Whereas, um, is this trying to get the younger generation to enjoy his works more. Uh, but they're still using the same language, but 
they're still using the same language, but they may change things. They may do it in modern dress or a different period from the time setting. Uh, and I have no uh, absolute views about that. I've seen that done very badly, uh, and I've seen it done very well. Uh, did you see uh, uh, the broadcast of uh, Benedict Cumberbatch in Hamlet? Yes. Whole scenes were moved around in that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it didn't bother. As a matter of fact, with the plays of Shakespeare himself, where we have both quarters and the folio, which we don't assimilate, uh, there are differences uh, between. Uh, if the play stayed in repertoire with Shakespeare's company, they may change this themselves. <coughs> yes? Uh, we're going to see Hamlet this weekend, and I just wondered if you could about anything that we should be looking for. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at how wonderful an actor Cumberbatch is. Uh, he's terrific. He's good uh, as the Hamlet? Yes, he's good as the Hamlet. Uh, and uh, I was a little slow to catch on to Ophelia, uh, but she does very well as it goes on. Uh, and the Claudius is excellent. Uh, Claudius is hard because we don't like him at the beginning. And he gets his big stuff only later on uh, when he's trying to repent his sin. Uh, but it's, uh, what is the name of the actor? Charon Hines. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that first name. Charon or Charon? Charon. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, he has been an excellent heavy actor, as they say. Uh, for many years, and, and he does uh, a marvelous job with that. Uh, the only, uh, uh, the acting is good, the directing is good. The only thing that I was disappointed about uh, was the lighting. Uh, I've gotten very used to uh, the uh, uh, productions of Metropolitan Opera uh, that are uh, uh, simulcast. Uh, uh, here, uh, and they had learned so much about how to do the visual stuff uh, in that. Uh, the people who were working on that production of Hamlet don't have as much skill at, 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 at handling the lighting. So there, there were places where I wanted to see more of what was happening on stage. Uh, that's a technical fault, not an aesthetic one. Ah, yes. The two sons of the king who brought the whales, did they use the same names throughout the play? Oh, uh, 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 Guiderius and Arvaragus? No, they are given, uh, Valerius, who abducted them, have, has given them uh, Welsh names. Uh, Polydor, which isn't Welsh anyway, it's Greek, uh, and Cadwall, which is Celtic. Uh, they have been brought up under other names and have no idea of who they are by birth. Okay, so they have, they have a second name. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.